Welcome to another episode of Real People, Real Stories, where we provide you with compelling tales from everyday people just like you. I'm your host, John Wendell Adams, author of the novels Betrayal and Payback, along with the soon-to-be-released novel, Ruthless. You can always find me by going to john at johnwendelladams.com. So for the next 23 minutes, let's get to today's guest. I think sometimes when you have those kinds of challenges, it shows a kind of grit. We all have to be rowing together in the same direction. Hey, Brenda. Hi, John. How are you? Every day is a good day, right? There, there you go. There you go. Well, I tell you what, I am excited to have you join us on Real People, Real Stories. And I'm really interested, highly interested. You know, we spent some time talking about your story and uh, what the compelling nature of it was. And I just um, am so excited about having you come on today and share that. So I know who you are, but if you just tell us your name, what part of the country you live in and, and what you do. Hi, I'm Brenda Asari and I live in Chicago and I am the president and CEO of the Alfred Group. The Alfred Group is a consulting firm which works with organizations across the country to help them build their capacity and do more good in the world. The way I sort of articulate that is you're helping people and clients and organizations really just be the best that they can be uh, for their boards and people individually and the clients that you serve. And I just think that it's a noble investment of your time and efforts and your staff. How long have you been at this? Gosh, John, you know, I've been at this for close to 30 years. I fell into it, graduated from the University of South Carolina with a psychology and business major and went to work for the American Cancer Society and then the American Red Cross. And then for the past 18 years, I've been with the Alfred Group. And so before it is that we dig into that, Mm -hmm. I guess I want to back up uh, a bit because you have turned this term non-for-profit on its head. And instead of saying non-for-profit, you call it something else. So I know you're big on terminology and uh, quotes and such, but tell us what non-for-profit really translates for you. Oftentimes, when individuals think of non-profits, they think that we don't have a profit. The kind of profit that non-profits strive to achieve is what we call return on mission return on impact, ROI or ROM. And the way we measure success in the social sector, that's the new terminology as we evolve this language from not-for-profit into the social sector. Our work is really around making communities stronger, partnering with individuals to help them not only to meet, but to exceed their possibilities. And I've just loved the way this entire sector has just shifted the way it thinks about its work and its impact. Got it. Well, the truth is that, uh, you know, you have helped in excess of 3,000 clients and helped them to raise in excess of a billion dollars. So that's a, that's a noble feat for you and your organization. So as I said before, I want to I want to dive into a couple things. You didn't just start here at Alfred Group. You didn't just start at uh, this whole thing about uh, social significance of people and clients and organizations. You know, where did that whole thing start for you? It really started as a part of my upbringing in family. I grew up in a family where we took care of each other and Growing up in the South, um, our neighbors were almost like our parents. So you learn that level of respect. And I think in many communities of color, we start with what we call mutual aid. We take care of our family. We take care of friends. We certainly know going back to the early days, we welcomed people into our families. They were not blood relatives. And I saw that demonstrated throughout my life. I can just remember different people coming to live with us kind of on their journey. Yes. You know, when you think about people coming from the South to the North, I could think of, you know, uncles and aunts and you know cousins who were trying to get their start in life and how they would come stay with my family while they found work and 
navigated the world. So sure. firsthand, I saw how um, that concept of mutual aid and caring really was lived out before my eyes. What you're describing is the great migration. And we yes. could have a whole discussion about that one uh, because it did have a real impact for many people and specifically yes. for people of color. But yes. you moved into from that, which was uh, really life community, you moved mm -hmm. into this thing of human services. What made you say, hey, this is the place that I really want to stay. This is where I want to land. This is where I want to really start to grow and build. Now spend some time talking about that. My very first job from undergraduate was working for the American Cancer Society. And that really became a calling because my grandfather was grappling with cancer and ultimately passed away from cancer. He was the apple of my eye and I knew that I was the apple of his. And I saw what my family endured as he underwent um, treatments and everything that comes along with having cancer. So when I was graduating from college, um, one of the very first places that I, in those days we had the yellow pages Right. Um, actually, I called and said that I was graduating from college and I was <laughs> looking for a job and I wanted to come in to talk with them about a job. I had no idea if they had a position or not. And so I went in and um, ultimately I got a job. My very first job was working for the American Cancer Society. And what I was doing was educating the community on the symptoms of cancer, especially communities of color, because we knew, as it is today, incidence of cancer is much higher in our community. And I felt that was one of the ways that I could give back. My grandfather was a smoker. Uh, so we know the cigarettes that he was smoking at that time were those filterless. Um, so you uh, were smoking tobacco, basically, yeah. wrapped in paper. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Remember those? So that's that's what got me really hooked was just that health um, aspect of it. And then educating my community on how we could safeguard ourselves, women with breast cancer, um, nutrition, um, being conscientious of what we were putting into our bodies, food, cigarette, everything else. So that's really how my journey began with the American Cancer Society, really right. going out into the community and educating people. There were some things that um, you, some challenges obviously that you faced as you tried to be about that mission. Uh, talk to me about some of those and was there much resistance or did people just welcome you with open arms saying, oh yeah, right, I wanna douse this cigarette and stop going down the road that I've been going down. I mean, did you reach or receive much uh, opposition, uh, have challenges during that period? What were the, some of the um, the impacts that you personally yeah, had? Really, yeah, you know, John, I, how things unfolded. Mind you, at the time, I was 22 years old, had just wow. graduated from undergraduate school. Sure. And here I am out in the community educating people about cancer. There weren't very many people who looked like me Many of the audiences, yes, I had a focus on communities of color, but I also went to the junior league meetings. I went to in prison and I'm like, okay, in prison. Right. That's all I got to do is smoke. Right. I got a lot of time <laughs> on my hands. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> but still they needed to be made aware. And one of the things sure. that we had so again, what I had to get past was the fact that I had to be an authority. Even though I was 22 years old. I realized I probably knew more about it than the people in the audience because I had studied it. I would studied the research. I had right. gone through the training. And so I had to first get past that, that, that aspect of a 22 year old and what does she know? Right? right. Right. And so that was the first thing in my head was to become comfortable with myself as a professional, even at that young age. And think of myself as an expert in that area. And I think whatever we do in life, you have to have that mindset. If, if you're right. going to be in front and leading is to feel that you can be a leader, that you've earned it, you deserve it, and not question yourself and feel like you're suffering from what they call the imposter syndrome. Because that's yes. really easy to develop when you're 22 years old. 
sure. and expected to go out and be the authority on a topic that you may not have had much experience with. But I did have experience. I had experience with my grandfather. So I was right. proximate to it from that standpoint. I heard uh, someone that I've really kind of come to appreciate. You probably know him, Brian Stevenson. And yes. he says, yeah, and he says that uh, in order to really embrace whatever the challenge is, whatever it is that you're dealing with, it has to be personal, and then you have to be proximate to it. Exactly. And, and for you, having this having happened with your grandfather, that certainly was personal. Yes. And then you made a decision at 22 to really be proximate to these individuals that were so suffering with uh, cancer. So it gave you some sense of authority, I would imagine. I really feel that the folks in the audience felt my passion and my commitment. And I right. think, again, that overshadows everything. I wasn't there as a 22-year-old kid. I was there as a professional providing information that was going to help them live a better life. And I had sure. to figure out my why first in order to kind of really show up and be the kind of leader that I needed to be. And I think about that now. And I, I have a, you know, I have kids who are in that age group and I'm thinking, can they show up and, and be the authority yep. and feel like their authority? And I know you become more and more of yourself as you get gain more experience yep. and have more confidence in yourself. So I look back at it now and I don't know, John, you just kind of step into it and you just do it, right? Either you do it or you don't. And, yep. you know, I want to call on, you know, Martin Luther King, given that today is his yes. birthday, ML sure. King Jr. And one of his quotes that I just love is this quote that, you know, faith is taking the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase. Ooh, I love that. I love that. I love that. Well, you know, what's interesting to me is um, we always deal with uh, interrogatives whenever it is that we're faced with uh, a new challenge, new responsibility. And we ask, well, how am I supposed to complete this? And it's to the point that you just made before. If I get the why, the how is pretty yeah. simple. The how is pretty simple. Yeah. So, the hard part is figuring out the why. Yeah, I agree with that. How many years at the Cancerous Society? How, how many years did you do that? I was only there for three years and decided that I would go back to graduate school um, to pursue my MBA. Got it. Um, it was very obvious to me working at that time in the social sector that the social sector didn't see itself as a business. And I think one of the things that I had to do and get my mind around, because eventually I went from being a program person to a fundraiser. Right. So within a year and a half, I actually had my own territory. So right. I was responsible for an office. I was responsible for staff. I was responsible for fundraising um, for a territory. And as a part of that, I realized, now mind you, I had been a business minor. So I knew a little bit about business. So yeah, again, I was young, but I thought I, knew, I thought I knew about business. But one thing I knew for sure was that they were not operating as what I thought a business should sure. operate. It was, sure. it, it was more of a hands out begging mentality versus thinking about what is the value proposition? So Ooh. yes, I'm fundraising, but what is the donor receiving in exchange? What's their right. motivation, right? right? What is the joy? What are we activating for the donor? So it's a, there's a relationship, there's an exchange of value and so that was something that I was really intentional upon when I decided to go back to pursue an MBA. My express desire was to come back into the nonprofit sector and help right. it operate more like a business with a heart, combining mission and purpose to achieve good in the world. Almost 20 years you've invested mm -hmm. in uh, the Alfred Group. You know, the thing is that um, you told me a story about this uh, dance company that really put on this performance. No words, just emotion and movement that communicated a story. And for you, it was really impactful associated with the work that you do. Yes. Helping them on, to be on mission, right? And really translate that into 
donors that are caring and giving. Why did that have such an impact on you? And how did it translate to trying to help them and others? You know, I've always loved the arts. I think of myself as a small art collector. I love going to the theater. This particular client, um, Deeply Rooted Dance Theater, is located here in Chicago, but it has an international footprint. And the storytelling that they're able to communicate through dance is something that I had never experienced before. I started working with them this past uh, June, June of 2021. And I've seen several of their performances live as well as uh, they were also featured on Good Morning America last year in November. And the ability to tell a story through movement, when you're sitting there as an individual watching, and, and oftentimes you think they're moving on stage and there's this connection. And so that tells me this connection that we have as humans. Sure. You know, oftentimes I, I, I think about people here in the U.S. and you know, there is a quote about what happens to one happens to all of us. And when I'm watching deeply rooted dance theater, there's electricity in the air. And I've seen this happen at their last performance at the auditorium where 7,500 people were on their feet. Wow. They felt that room was pulsating. Yeah. It's like you feel the depth of the passion of the expression that's, that's coming through each of those dancers. And I just find that to be such an amazing gift that I received. And it only deepened my commitment to make sure that they were successful in securing and raising the money for a new dance center. Because oftentimes Black dance companies, I call them, they're almost like freeloading. They never have their own homes, a home that will allow them to continue to express their creativity even further and really deepen their work in a meaningful way. So I'm so committed to them securing the funds for their new dance center, because I understand what it's going to mean to the community. Also what it means to, in the form of artistic excellence, Right. And also what it means to me as a receiver of that right. excellence and seeing people on stage who connect with me, their pain, their joy. And at the same time, we're experiencing that together. You've raised, I don't know, three or four different significant comments. The one that I guess I want to hear from you on, because it's a real, you've flipped this whole thing about giving and donors and yes. who does what and you know, how you translate uh, philanthropy into a new term. That's your term. You've kind of flipped this whole thing on its head. I guess I want to hear from you in terms of uh, donor significance, uh, donor responsibility, you know, how a donor really sees who they are in this uh, relationship between these nonprofit organizations like the one you just described, and themselves. When we traditionally think of philanthropy, we have a picture of our, in our heads of who is a philanthropist. And in this moment, and I would say since probably 2017, 2018, and I don't want to take credit for the flipping because this has been um, a series of um, undertakings of research that I've been able to be a part of given kind of my place in this sector, the different levels of partnerships that I've been fortunate to work within research projects, AFP International, but, but we're really on this movement to expand who is a philanthropist. Traditionally, when we think about a philanthropist, we think of a wealthy white man. Right. And what we're trying to do now in this movement is to expand this beyond philanthropy to what we call generosity. Got it. Because being generous is not, especially as it relates to communities of color. Yes. Being generous. Now, we didn't see ourselves as philanthropists because we were just helping our family, helping friends. But generosity, we're trying to expand this word where generosity is elevated and valued just as much as philanthropy. Right. So generosity is not only giving of your time, your talent, your treasure, but also your testimony. Sure. 
what you bring to the table as an advocate to help organizations like Deeply Rooted Dance Theater be able to secure the funds that it needs, engage the right people around the table to help it continue right. to grow in the future. So there's just really this movement that I'm passionate around in terms of bringing, not bringing more donors of color into it because we have always been there. It's right. really been, it's not been a matter of uh, donors of color being disinterested. We have just been disconnected. No one mm -hmm. has reached out to us. And so that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about as I work within this sector is elevating the role and the possibilities and the need for the social sector to engage with donors of color. Yeah, so I love that. I really do. And, you know, Brenda, I have to say that from a business standpoint, we oftentimes, I have, when I've done consulting work and such, I help clients to see the value of this term of resources. And normally when we say resources, we're talking about green pieces of paper with the dead president's faces exactly. on it. Exactly. But in reality, it's people, tools, equipment, time, money. That's what you're really saying. When you talk about this thing of generosity, it really is this aspect of everything that I can bring. Exactly. To the table. I get that. I really do. That's uh, pretty significant. And then the other thing, that I find so interesting in terms of your thoughts and thinking associated with giving and generosity and philanthropy is this whole notion of give the greatest gift. I like that story that you told me actually of the person who was challenged to give a greater gift than they had actually thought. And then what your comment was about uh, the million dollars, you remember that? You know, if I gave a million dollars, you remember that one? I have lots of stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> this one specifically was around the fact that what you told me, I think, was that if a, a person gave a million dollars, oh, remember that? Yes. I always tell my clients who are shy about asking. Sure. We may read someone gave a million dollars to another organization and then they're like, well, they get I'm like, no one gives their last million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> if they can give away a million dollars, there's more right. from where that came from. Because no right. one gives their last million dollars away. Now, I did recently read about some guy who gave away a um, billion dollars. So I want to do the research and find out who that guy was. So he gave <laughs> away all of his money. So I'm like, now, I, I, I know that there are lots of people who operate from being truly altruistic. Um, but I really want to go back to see what happened to him. Did he make more money? Because you know what? I, being a person of faith, I really do believe too that when you give, you receive, sure. right? We all know about, you know, bringing your 10% to the storehouse and the windows yeah, will be right. open. That's so I right. want to go find out. And I just read about this. I just, it was just a headline. I read about this guy who gave away all this money. I'm like, well, I need to go check him out to see if because he gave away a billion, um, he's now living off of two. Because I truly believe that when we give, we do receive. Absolutely. It is multiplied. Absolutely. Well, and you know what? The other thing is that, uh, as I said early on, you've been uh, with the Alpha Group for almost 20 years. You've been CEO for almost 10. You know, what are your aspirations at this point? I mean, this is a, a now a new year in 2022. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that you and your staff have said and you know, pondered over that question, but I'm sure that you have personally. So aspirations at this point, Brenda, talk yeah, about that. It's an interesting question. In March of 2020, there was so much uncertainty for all of us, you know, not, not only personally, but also as a business owner, trying to navigate what's going to happen, what's going to happen with our clients, people are now working from home, what's going to happen with the stock market, are people still going to give, Were clients sure. still want to hire consultants. We really had to step back and look at the Alfred Group with fresh eyes, almost as if we were a startup, and ask ourselves, what are the essential things that we know? How do we go back to our why? How do we go back to our core and continue to bring value to clients? So let's figure out where are they now and what are their greatest needs? A lot of our work revolves around capital campaigns or endowments or strategic planning. And everyone's scrambling trying to figure out what the 
landing and what the environment was going to mean. And I, I feel I'm so proud of my staff and my team that we were able to really look at our clients and meet them where they needed. So we, we had to turn, how do we help them keep donors giving? How do we help them understand how to solicit people via Zoom when we right. used to be sitting in their offices and in their living rooms or yeah. at a lunch? Now right. we're doing this via you know this virtual environment, and so I'm so proud. I mean, it was one of the best years, but it showed us. I think sometimes when you have those kinds of challenges, it shows a kind of grit. We all have to be rowing together in the same direction. Right. And we do that. We're still doing it because there's still lots of uncertainty. Just as we work with our clients relative to strategic planning and helping them to figure out their new North Star or their new pathway forward, we're doing the same as a firm, looking right. at how do we continue to be more relevant. When you ask me, you know, what am I thinking about now? I understand the importance of people. I always understood um, the importance of people because consulting is a people business. You can't be yeah. consulting. If I want to consult to myself, <laughs> I don't have a business, right? So, <laughs> so you got to have people. It's a people centric business, but it's also sure. a time because time is our inventory. Yep. So as a leader, I think there are a few things that has really elevated and shown themselves to be things that I need to keep in mind. Number one is area of being curious, being curious and always learning. I learned into my role as CEO when I first came to this role, because I'd been with the firm, it was an easy transition on one hand. On another hand, it wasn't because I knew what was. Right. And I needed to now create a bridge to a new future, right? Sure, sure. And so having this curiosity and really stepping back and asking questions and also enabling myself to ask others. And I didn't, I tell you what, it was great when I realized I didn't have to have all the answers. Right. And that I had other people sitting around the table with answers, oftentimes better than mine. They, you know, better than mine, more thought out. So now when I think about how we work together, I think about what is it that I can see that they can't see? What are they seeing? that I'm not seeing and what are we all not seeing? So those are the kind of the three kind of frameworks that I currently operate within. That way I'm always conscious of others within the firm and what they can bring to the table, the thought leadership and value that they can bring to the firm to help us continue to be relevant. Right. Leading in terms of understanding what the sector needs, what nonprofit social sector organizations need to grow and be resilient because that's what we're focused on now is building resiliency. I love what you had to say, especially the first part in terms of being curious. I think for all of us, it's really important. I mean, it's really significant. And the thing you also said about the uncertainty of, um, you know, what started with uh, the whole, this whole pandemic and, you know, the last two years, I mean, this whole notion of relevancy, I think is a key critical ingredient. But the one item that you mentioned that I really appreciate is sort of this three-part prism, right? The things that you see that they don't, that they see that you don't, and then looking sort of together. I, I think that that's really essential. And the fact that you're really trying to bring that relevancy to your clients and such, I think that's really special. I, I really do. Thank you for sharing that. I also want to say that I know that you're a real quote collector. <laughs> At least that's what somebody told me. Yeah. And it, yeah. And if you had two or three comments or quotes or leave behinds that you wanted to just push forward, uh, what do you think those would be? Here's one of my favorites. And, yes. and I say that about all the quotes, but <laughs> here's, one of my, here's one of my favorites, um, sure. by James Baldwin. A journey is called that because you cannot know what you will discover on the journey, what you will do, what you will find, nor what you find will do to you. Ooh, wow, wow, wow. That's got like, three or four different landing points. Exactly. And that's how I feel about life. And that's why this is my favorite one, John. I like to leave you and our listeners 
with is we all are on a journey. Sure. And, and becoming is better than being. I, that's part of that curiosity and continuing to grow, not feeling stagnant. Sure. And I think too, being able to answer your calling, because I think essentially we all want to live a life of significance. That's right. how I feel. I'm at a milestone in my life now. And as I look back, I think, what have I done right. to make a difference in the world? What am I leaving behind? How have I made the world better? For me, that's so important. And I try to imbue that in my children in terms sure. of being intentional around their lives and really thinking about their lives. And what does it mean to have a best life? It, it may not mean having a ton of money, but having that joy, that happiness, contentness. Yeah. Right? Being yeah. So again, I think we all are on a journey of exploration. One of my favorite books right now is a book called Living an Examined Life, Ooh. Wisdom for the Second Half of the Journey by James Hollis, PhD. Wow, I like that. Well, you know what? Um, of the quotes you shared, the one that touched me the most, right, is becoming is better than being. That means yes. that you're always moving forward. I, I you're love always that. moving forward. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you tie that with your comment about you personally being curious, well, as you move forward, you're really taking a view of the landscape across where you are in relationship to where you're going. Brenda, thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. I've learned a lot. I'm going to look thank back you. at this. Yeah, I'm going to look back at this time and time again. But the one thing, as you talked about uncertainty, over the last two years, we're not done with that, right? So, yeah, and so I'm likely going to ask you to come back and share with us the things that you have gained as you continue to move forward in becoming for you and the Alfred Group and your staff and your clients. When I when we get back together, you're probably going to tell me that it's moved from three thousand to ten thousand clients, and you've up the ante from a billion to several billion, but I'm interested not just in the, the numbers, but just the things that you have gained sort of along the way. I really appreciated the time. Thank you for that. Well, I, I appreciate when you said going from 3,000 to 10,000, that's exactly the path we're on as we look at mm -hmm. how do we, from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint, make quality consulting services available to all organizations. So again, we're working on the plan to launch a new line of service where we can touch even more organizations who desire to make an impact in their communities. So John, thank you for this time. Um, yeah. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you for being a, just someone that I admire so much for the work and, and for elevating these stories. And we all learn from each other. And again, yep. we're all connected in this That's human right. race. That's so right. Thank you for your great work, John, and um, cheers to living your best life in 2022. Yeah, and I look forward to having you come back. So thank yes. you again. Listen, have a great day and we'll talk soon. You can always find me by going to john at johnwendelladams.com. 